So as we continue through section two, uh, we're still talking about violence and resistance. Uh, today we're going to switch gears slightly though. Uh, rather than talking about any of the uh, violent <coughs> actions that took place in the 1850s, uh, we're going to just kind of, uh, we're going to talk about some legislation that was passed that sort of sets up a situation for people to react to it. Um, and unfortunately the reactions will be kind of wild and yes, uh, there will be some violent reactions to what is called the Kansas-Nebraska Act. So let's just uh, get an understanding of what this legislation was and uh, who was responsible for it. So let's start with that. Let's start with Stephen A. Douglas. Uh, a while back, we met Stephen A. Douglas when we talked about the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And what I told you was that Stephen Douglas is essentially he's the guy that was able to get that great compromise passed. Um, uh, we, we met four of the major players that were wrapped up in, in, in making that happen, arguing for and against it. But in the end, Stephen A. Douglas was the uh, member of Congress who was able to get it passed through Congress. And so uh, he has already made a name for himself as a leading senator. Uh, he is uh, very ambitious. Uh, he is very astute. And he has uh, very grand plans for his home state of Illinois. And because of that, we end up seeing the, uh, him propose this Kansas-Nebraska Act. So if we were to look at it geographically and we see where Illinois is, the home state of Stephen Douglas, just west of Illinois is an unsettled territory called the Kansas-Nebraska Territory. Now you're working on your map. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, uh, not in this video, but later. And uh, if you were to look at what you're filling out on your map and what you're labeling, you would see this Kansas-Nebraska territory. It's a big territory just west of Illinois. And uh, as the, the idea of expansion westward, which we've spent enough time on, is drawing more and more Americans moving into those territories that we've added through our manifest destiny, Stephen A. Douglas sees an opportunity for his home state of Illinois. Because, again, if you were to look at the map, geographically speaking, Illinois is almost like smack dab in the middle of the continent. And at that point, it's at the edge of the eastern uh, part of the United States. And it's sort of this gateway into the west. And he recognizes that uh, Illinois could end up being this thoroughfare as people continue to move west. But in order for that to happen, we need to settle the Kansas-Nebraska territory. And we need to have some incentive for people to start moving out to that territory. Because if they do, they're going to move right through his state of Illinois, and that's going to create some economic benefits. It's going to create traffic going through Illinois. It's going to be mean the, the building of railroads through Illinois, all that kind of stuff. So that is a lot of the background to his proposition of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Now, that all sounds great uh, for uh, Stephen A. Douglas and his plans for his home state of Illinois, but there's also some, I don't want to say selfish, but there's some uh, individual aspirations that he has uh, for his future and the Kansas-Nebraska Act and the settlement of these territories and so on and so forth uh, is going to uh, have some impact on his own personal ambitions because eventually he plans to run for president. Like I said at this point Stephen A. Douglas was already a pretty uh, successful senator he was already um, you know recognized as being an astute politician so on and so forth and so he has grand plans for his future. However, if you have plans for running for the uh, presidency in the 1850s, there's one political issue that you really have to be careful about how you deal with it. What's that political issue? The uh, controversy over slavery, obviously, right? So whatever he does in terms of proposing legislation in Congress, in this case, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, he has to be cognizant of that, and he has to be careful on, on how he affects uh, voters essentially in both the North and the South. So let's take all of that into consideration and let's see what he comes up with uh, for the Kansas Nebraska Act. Okay, so I put here um, what I was just saying, there's another bullet point here about keeping both people in the North and the South happy. We know that if you want to be president someday, you're going to have to get votes from the North and the South. And so when he proposes this Kansas Nebraska Act, he has to be able Concerned with that and aware of it, he's got to try to keep people on both sides of the country happy. All right, so how does he do that? 
there's going to be a couple main provisions that I want you to know and understand about the Kansas Nebraska. Uh, number one, Stephen Douglas proposes that the Kansas Nebraska territory be split into two separate territories. Instead of it uh, potentially becoming one big state, Kansas Nebraska, he says, why not divide it into two and then it can become two states, Kansas and Nebraska. Now, if you've been paying attention uh, through this chapter, you should be able to see why this is already a genius political move. If it was going to be one state eventually, what's the problem? What's the issue that could arise with that? Well, it's all based on the slavery issue and the slavery controversy. What kind of state will it be? If it's only going to be one, it's going to have to be a slave state or free state. Well, what if we make it two? Do you see where he's going with this? Uh, we've seen in the past with different compromises in Missouri in 1820, with the Great Compromise in 1850, this idea of keeping the North and the South, the slave and the free, balanced in our country and Congress, so on and so forth. This guy's a genius, right? Okay, well, what if we propose that both territories, Kansas and Nebraska, eventually both states as they become states, what if they both have popular sovereignty? Again, this is a genius political move under the circumstances we're in in the 1850s. Rather than Stephen A. Douglas saying uh, they should both become slave states, or they should both become free states, or we should have one slave state and one free state, or rather than just the government at all having a say in it, Stephen Douglas sees an opportunity to remove that part of the politics and say, why not use popular sovereignty? At this point, Stephen Douglas is starting to recognize the, the, the political power of this concept. Because, as you remember, popular sovereignty means that the people living in the state or the territory will have the power to vote whether or not to be a slave state or a free state. So it, with both of these propositions or these provisions, Stephen A. Douglas is really showing his uh, political awareness. And if you just look at it in these terms, can you tell whether or not Stephen A. Douglas is pro-slavery or anti-slavery? Nothing that he proposes here suggests either one, right? It's a genius way for him to stay politically right in the middle. All right, now, it gets even more genius than that because if you look a little bit deeper, um, we're gonna find out that Stephen A. Douglas is not only keeping both the North and the South happy, but he also has uh, his own idea of how this is gonna turn out uh, kind of in the back of his mind. Why is he able to keep northerners happy with this proposition well technically best case scenario if we're going to use popular sovereignty in both of these new states what could happen for the northern uh, free state uh, supporters they could get two new free states technically right it's going to be left to the people to vote worst case scenario maybe one becomes free one becomes slave could it happen that they're both uh, end up being slave states, which is why the South is just as happy about this, because they're looking at a best case scenario, we can get two new slave states out of this deal. And maybe worst case scenario is maybe one will become a free state, one will become, and then everybody's happy anyway. This is just a genius, genius situation. Now, as I was saying, let me bring this back up. Um, there's sort of an underlying genius here as well, uh, because Stephen A. Douglas, while he recognizes that he can't just overtly, openly say that he's pro-slavery or anti-slavery, because if he does that, he's going to alienate half of the voters in the country when he eventually wants to run for president. So he can't say that. So he proposes legislation this way, using this whole popular sovereignty idea, which kind of leaves him in the middle somewhere. But if you were to sit down with Stephen A. Douglas, maybe in the back room somewhere, and light up a cigar and just have a man-to-man -man conversation with him, and you asked him, all right, come on, Steve, are you pro-slavery or anti-slavery? He would tell you that he was anti-slavery. But he recognizes that he can't just be open about that, and so he starts to become this Mr. Popular Sovereignty guy. In the meantime, he's looking at this situation in Kansas and Nebraska, and he recognizes that in the end, even though the legislation is proposed this way and the people are going to get to vote, he knows pretty well certain that in the end, it's probably going to end up being two free states. 
Now, how does he know that? Think about that for a second. How does he know that in the end, the people are going to end up voting out there in Kansas and Nebraska for two free states? Could it be just about where they are geographically? Could it be about, well, it could be about a lot of things, but there's something he knows specifically that is going to affect it. What can't you grow in either Kansas or Nebraska based on the climate and the soil and the farm? Cotton. So in his mind, the only reason uh, Southerners are moving westward into the new territories is to expand the plantation culture, to grow more cotton, in turn, also growing the institution of slavery. You can't grow cotton in Kansas and Nebraska. So he doesn't anticipate very many Southerners moving into that territory whatsoever because they can't have cotton plantations. This, is, this guy's like a genius. So in the end, he knows that the majority of the settlers that are going to move into these territories are probably going to be non-cotton farming, non-slaveholding, probably northerners. And so when the time comes for these territories to vote, they're probably going to vote to be free states. Now, that's all just sort of a setup. We don't know how that's going to work out, but this is how he proposes it, and this is what he anticipates for the future of Kansas and Nebraska. And in turn, uh, it's going to help him in his state of Illinois, but it's also going to help him in his eventual uh, run for the presidency. And man, in the end, people are looking at this guy like uh, from both the North and the South saying, we like this guy. So uh, I'm going to leave it at that. We're not going to talk about what does happen uh, after the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. I'm going to leave that up to you to do a little bit of reading and find out what does happen out there in Kansas.